Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Building an Innovation-Led Economic Vitality Effort. Um, just a couple quick housekeeping notes before we before we get started. Everyone on the line is muted. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to either use that chat function there or there's a questions pane. Um, just type them in there and um, you know I will be monitoring that. Um, we will take questions um, throughout the webinar, so feel free to type them in at any time. And then, of course, we'll do um, we'll have some time for, for Q&A at the end. Um, the webinar is also being recorded, so if you miss anything or want to share it with some of your um, you know other staff or board members, et cetera, um, you know, it will be recorded and available shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Matt Wagner, who's our Vice President of the Revitalization Programs here at the National Main Street Center to give a quick introduction and take us through today's webinar. All right. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning to those on the uh, mountain and west uh, coast, and then uh, obviously good afternoon to those on the east coast. And um, so I'm sure many of you were up late uh, with the big election uh, last night, but uh, today's topic um, is really about how do we um, create sort of a, a unique experience um, from an economic vitality perspective from and really rethinking um, you know, sort of this, these concepts of innovation as they relate to our work in downtown and district uh, planning um, and placemaking and all those sort of elements. And for the most part, we've, I think we've, we always think when we hear the word innovation um, that we're thinking of sort of the technology field, the, you know, the biomedical space, the, the pharmacy space, um, tech and internet and, and that sort of thing. But innovation cuts across all industries. And certainly the work that, that we do, there's quite a lot of innovative thought process that goes into whether it's design elements um, on the street or the kind of retailing activities that are taking place um, in our stores. And so, and so, you know, in terms of, of the vehicle that we use, economic vitality, uh, to enhance uh, those kinds of efforts, innovation certainly is a large component of that. So the way I'm framing essentially our webinar today is really think, you know, from a structural perspective, how can we enhance that within, you know, the economic vitality committee or task force or however you're, you're sort of set up to a mindset amongst um, not only ourselves as, as leaders in the space, many of you are probably executive directors, program managers, et cetera, but also the volunteers that are participating um, in the work. And then finally, just uh, innovation from a programming perspective. You know, we've got our hallmarks in real estate development and housing and, and recruitment and retention activities and certainly entrepreneurship. How do we bring innovation, um, that thought process to the work that we're doing? So just in terms of an overall um, framework, there's a, there's a saying that a lot of folks in the um, research and development, corporate re, re, uh, research and development space sort of used. And it's a, it's a concept that, that innovation really occurs at the crossroads, this intersection of people's different backgrounds and experiences um, who are, are essentially really, you know, fundamentally different um, than, you know, our normal sort of foundation uh, that we set within our economic vitality committee. You know, in the past, we, we've spoken in terms of members that you might want to include, you know, around sort of the bankers and attorneys, business owners, property owners. Um, but oftentimes, we, we become too siloed in our thinking um, as a result. And so I would certainly encourage you to, um, you know, sort of think outside the box about the makeup, um, that framing of who's participating um, on your economic vitality or who you're seeking out new ideas from, from, you know, the, sort of the creatives within the community, your urban designers, graphic designers, internet folks, you know, artists. Um, if you've got a corporate presence, you know, those that are working in research and development or new product uh, development, um, new residents that really bring fresh perspective and um, don't always have some of the um, you know, the, the baggage perhaps or some of the perceptions that longtime residents might have is a good way to sort of mix in and include um, from a community engagement perspective. To young entrepreneurs, 
And then also just think of new groups. I'm, I'm really, frankly, amazed at how libraries um, are becoming really a force in um, entrepreneurial thinking within communities. Um, I was at a, a conference of uh, Rural Rise. It was talking about, um, you know, rural entrepreneurship. And, you know, the National Library Association was there talking about their role in entrepreneurship. So think about new partners um, as well. And then um, just to kind of wrap uh, wrap this up, also um, share trends, educate your your committee again or your task force or however you're you're set up on what you're seeing, so that there's that sort of knowledge transference. Um, you know, m many of us who are so close to it, we we have the um, you know the experience of seeing it, going to conferences, you know, learning new things. And it's it's key that we also share that with our members, so they're also seeing that sort of breadth of unique um, opportunities. And then finally, I think it's just things like you know don't isolate yourself. Um, you know, take trips, go out and see other places, not just yourself, but in some cases, if you have regional or other examples, you know, go out and take your committee um, along. You know, isolation really creates, unfortunately, more narrow thinking. And so innovation is really about broad perspectives um, and not just looking at your own industry, um, so to speak, our downtown industry, but looking at other kinds of forms um, that are doing different kinds of work that then we can relate and transfer that knowledge and relate it back to the work that we're doing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about mindset. You know, mindset is 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 one of those sort of terms uh, that relate to this siloed thinking that um, we often find ourselves um, in. And there's a lot of different tools um, out there that can be used to sort of open one's mind, get us thinking about different ideas. And one of those concepts is called ideation. Um, and ideation is something that you can use with with your committee when you're trying to problem solve or think about different ways of attacking a problem or an issue, or frankly, just generating new ideas for you know, new activities or new kinds of retail um, to bring into the, into the downtown. And so we're gonna try this. I've never actually done this on a webinar form, but we're gonna try this as a, as a group. Um, I'm gonna run you through a very quick exercise to demonstrate the power um, of ideation. Um, and it's called the cow exercise. And so, yes, the famous cow. I am in Wisconsin, so I had to use a cow um, as my um, example here. And so, one of the things you can do is just quickly, um, and I'll get some tips on um, how do you utilize ideation uh, within your economic vitality uh, group, is to take a, uh, a concept or an idea or an issue, that kind of thing, and quickly sketch out um, some business ideas. And that's what we're gonna do with the Cal um, exercise. So what I want you to do um, is where I want you to think of a business concept or business concepts that involve the cow. The cow is the star. Now, we are a nice organization. <laughs> we are not going to hurt the cow. Um, so, um, Broaden your perspective on how the cow could be used as part of a business concept. Example would be the rent a cow. We are in a sharing economy, and so we are going to use rent a cow as our business. You know, you may want the, your yard just like a goat, um, your grass clippings, or what have you. Um, and so we are developing a rent a cow business. So I am going to give you two minutes, and I want you to use the chat function to post your business idea as soon as they hit, um, because this is something that should be done very, very quick. What just immediately pops in your mind is to how you could use the cow as a business idea. So everyone should have a chat function, so if you come up with an idea, please post it to the group. Watching my watch.
Sorry, Matt. We got one in the questions, one which is dairy-related retail products, specialty, special, specialty cheeses, <laughs> milk, oh, etc. Yeah. Um, another one. I got a cow cafe. Cow <laughs> <laughs> oh, <there you> <laughs> I like it. Um, compost and fertilizer, um, a pop-up shared artist space, create your own milk yeah. flavors, cow pie bingo event, <laughs> Love uh, it. a milking exercise workout group. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my God, that was great, you guys. Uh, kiss the cow for 25 cents, pop up ice cream parlor, landscape maintenance with cheese as a byproduct. <laughs> that's a value added product, byproduct. And, All right, I think that's and, good. great. An utterly I, well, ridiculous I, gift shop, U T T E R L Y, <laughs> ridiculous gift shop. <laughs> I wish I could see these. I only saw the one, so I'm glad, Steve, you were able to, to see them and, and pop them, up. Yeah. So I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Th thanks, everyone, for in indulging me in this this, uh, in this exercise. But I hope, if anything, um, in a very quick m amount of time, as you can see here, literally two minutes, how many ideas get developed when you sort of allow your mind <laughs> to expand, be free, to be creative, um, to not have sort of um, a very tight framework around what could be possible, um, how you were able to develop some really kind of cool um, and interesting uh, concepts just from a cow. So these are just some other um, examples um, that how you can use a cow as part of a business activity or a product or inventory. So just some thoughts on ideation and how you could use this with your group or your team. So ideation, much like my first um, comment around the crossroads of innovation and how important it is to get people with different backgrounds and experiences, if you're facing a really critical issue or you're trying to brainstorm uh, based on a market strategy or whatever the kinds of businesses, um, as an example, that might be effective for your downtown, then swell what we call swell the team. Bring in others from different walks of, of life, different groups, different organizations, and use that as, in essence, we call it ideation, but in many respects, it's like brainstorming. Um, don't take a lot of time. I think one of the, the, um, the critical um, uh, errors that we, we make is that we, we try to stretch this too far. Um, and most of your great ideas happen extremely quickly. So maybe take 15 minutes um, of a meeting to discuss but no longer because what tends to happen is you get down rabbit holes um, or it revolves into a we can't do this, that kind of thing. And so usually this is something that you can do very, very quickly to just drum up new ideas and you know, that sort of thing. At the forefront, it's always good to establish the ground rules, to sort of frame the discussion clearly, articulate what the issue um, is, and keep focused. Um, by doing so, okay? Um, because, you know, this is not an area where you want a lot of tangents um, going on or parking lot uh, issues being developed. Also create an environment of being inclusive and safe dialogue. Everyone has something to contribute. And so if one person's dominating the thought process or folks are sort of worried about speaking up, um, that's not conducive um, to ideation. You know, if you want to sort of catalog or prioritize, you can do that at the, the end in sort of a ranking or sticky, you know, sticky dots, you know, any of that kind of um, work, you can do that. And then, you know, finally, it's really important to, you know, then work plan them out. Um, great ideas are great, but lack of ex execution, um, you know, really kills them and they just stay as ideas and <laughs> never actually get carried out. And then finally, just remember to sort of rule out this is part of those ground rules you know, the whole, we can't do that, or we already tried it. Um, I'm amazed at, at the, the we already tried it uh, sort of scenario because, you know, nine times out of 10, it's, it, it's timing uh, can be the issue. Having the right people in place can be the issue. Um, 
you know, not not having sort of the trend lines uh, moving in that direction at that point in time can change the the whole dynamic. So sort of rule out and, and again create this open, safe atmosphere to think outside the box. All right, another um, tool that you might want to consider, and 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 this is an exercise we won't do um, online, but I would encourage you to get. Uh, uh, to think through what we call mind mapping um, to, in order to sort of discover, uh, discover your gaps or your blind spots um, in your innovation thinking. So I, I, I took some time and just mind map. This is my mind map relative to you know, the work that I do um, at you know, the National Main Street Center. And I, and I put it in the four points. Um, and what you'll notice is um, in mind mapping, and I think in sort of developing an innovative thought process, it's really important to look at sort of adjacent industries, things that may not be um, directly um, related to downtown revitalization or urban district revitalization, but influence or impact the work that we do. And so you'll notice things like in economic vitality, I, I look at a lot of like articles on City Lab or research uh, that the Urban Land Institute is putting out, or a great resource called Springwise that every week will send you new business concepts that they're seeing throughout the world. And it just kind of gives you an idea of like how people are thinking about new retail concepts, not only in the US, but everywhere around the world. It's, it's a great resource. You know, to blue zones that are talking about the intersections of health and the economy and, and longevity. Uh, and then under organization, you know, just looking at what's the news going on in, in the world to um, social entrepreneurship um, and how to think about, um, you know, your organization as, as, a, um, as, an, as, as an entrepreneurial venture. Um, so things like the Skoll Foundation or the Kaufman Foundation. Um, that can then, you know, help in terms of policy and program development. And then in design, um, well, certainly, we, you know, we're talking about historic buildings and streetscapes, but I'm also interested um, in what's happening in, in, in trail development, both in rural and urban concepts. Uh, it's places like Curb that's really about um, design um, from a, a building and a vehicle, all kinds of different um, elements uh, to it and certainly partners like the project for public spaces and what's happening in the placemaking and then you see my promotions and marketing and it's clear that that that's not an area that um, that I've looked at very much and so it was like wow um, that's a big gap um, so how am I going to um, sort of think more innov innovatively in looking at different concepts within promotions and marketing that can influence the work uh, that we're doing there. Um, and so these are lots of different places. And so what I would encourage you to do, do your own mind map, figure out where your gaps um, are in terms of where you're getting your information and how you're thinking, you know, about new, I, uh, new ideas. Um, but use, you know, tools to help you through that process. Um, I'm a big uh, Twitter user. I don't tweet. Um, but I do look at lots of things that are related to this mind map here. It's a great tool for getting information very quickly. Um, and then if you want to take a deeper dive into it, um, you can. But if you just want to like a quick snapshot of like what's coming out from these new groups or different concepts, you can do that relatively easy and it doesn't take a lot of time just simply by following different kinds of organizations um, or different publications or what have you. I'm sure many of you do that on Facebook or LinkedIn um, or just book bookmarking um, on your, you know, your internet um, face and, um, you know, every morning taking a quick look at new publications that are on those, those bookmark sites. Those are other sort of helpful tools um, so that you're, again, you're expanding um, sort of your horizon as to where you're getting information to hopefully help you to think more innov innovatively from an economic vitality perspective. Okay, come on. 
All right, so where do innovative ideas, concepts typically um, come from? And there's a number of different ways. Um, these are some thoughts, and I'll share additional ones um, with you as we roll through this. But here's a few tips, I think, to improve your odds. Um, be a voracious reader. Um, I know all of you are extremely uh, busy, and um, you don't have a lot of time. You're running festivals, and you're trying to recruit businesses. Um, but in any kind of downtime, if you have the ability, again, to use like a Twitter or something like that, these are great but quick ways um, to gain a lot of knowledge um, through just sort of reading articles and that, that sort of thing. Um, be dedicated to lifelong learning. When you have the opportunity for professional development opportunities, um, joining webinars, uh, going through Main Street America Institute, I'll put a plug um, there. These are great ways to sort of um, improve opportunities for new ideas, learn what others are doing, and then adapt to your own work. Um, just personality-wise, be willing to try new things without fear of failure. Um, I think that's in many respects holds us back um, from you know taking a chance. And I think in the nonprofit space, especially when the private markets aren't moving as we wish in our downtowns or, or urban districts, you know sometimes we have to take the lead. Um, on that, and we can only do that if we're thinking innovatively and entrepreneurially. Um, be willing to explore other areas. Get outside of your community. Look at other places. Even look at competitors. What are they doing? Um, expand your network. Use the point. Uh, so I'll, I'll put a plug there. I mean, it's just a great opportunity to hear and see what others in your field are doing. Um, and then just remember that uh, ideas are great, but the ability to transfer that idea to implementation and action is really the where things occur. And I always say that about just entrepreneurs in, in, in general. You know, you can come up with the greatest idea in the world, but if you can't execute on it, it's not worth anything. And so, um, you know, taking what you're coming up with in those ideation sessions or what you're seeing in other areas the ability to pivot that to implementation through your economic vitality group is really where the difference is made, obviously. Also, ideas come from just our backgrounds, and that's why I, I, I'm sort of harping on this, this, you know, bringing people from um, a diverse uh, group, you know, of, of folks, um, because we all bring different kinds of backgrounds. And this is really showing you um, not only where ideas come from, um, but how people tend to launch entrepreneurial ventures generally is based on prior and current jobs or hobby or interest. And so use that um, and, and use what you're seeing to generate new ideas. But also a lot comes from just trends and being able to spot that. And that's why I think that mind mapping and, and in sort of enlarging where you're getting information from is, is so important uh, to this innovation concept. Uh, in downtown revitalization. So things like trends that we're seeing in logistics um, and equipment uh, to the internet that really has lowered the cost of doing business. Um, and so that's led to, you know, a, just this groundswell of, of artisans and crafters and makers using things like Etsy, um, but also coming to farmer's markets, um, you know, where now people, you know, are able at very low cost to develop a product and ship it out to all across the world 24 seven. And that really wasn't possible before. To small scale producers, you know, these are smaller manufacturing operations. Manufacturing in general used to be the lowest, had the lowest rates of entre entrepreneurship simply because it was so expensive um, to launch a business in manufacturing. But now, with 3D printers and high-speed um, uh, processing equipment um, to the cost of uh, putting something online, what have you, you can be making a product um, that's high-end, whether it's apparel or um, food-based um, or what have you, uh, pretty inexpensively, even though you're not doing it in a mass scale. Um, to certainly leading to more mobile retailing operations, and then this increasing online sales for traditional bricks and mortar. The sharing um, economy trends um, that we're seeing out there, and certainly um, 
while Airbnb has its pluses and minuses for a lot of small towns across the uh, America, Airbnb now is, is sort of serving um, and making up that void where you don't have, um, you know, sort of hotel rooms in your downtown and can't support a full-blown hotel. This is providing that tool uh, through the shared economy experience of being able to offer um, that. You can also look at um, ideas from just improvements of existing products or services. So it's not always a new thing, but a variation or a nuance um, of the existing product or service. I mean, take something just as basic um, as a hammer and adding uh, you know, air compressor to it, and you have an air hammer, to changes in how we read books. Now, some of us still prefer <laughs> a real book, um, but how that has changed dramatically, not only in how we read it, but how it's being sold and where you pick it up, um, that sort of thing. Ideas can come from just seeing other ideas and making improvements um, on it, okay, or just doing it differently to fit your particular need or community. Um, so just variations and improvements, obviously, in photography to coffee um, sales to social, um, uh, social media. We're also seeing shifts in population that result in new opportunities. So think back to the mortgage crisis back in 07, 08, combined with lots of student uh, debt uh, that uh, the many millennials are experiencing. That's really led to less change over in single family housing um, in the US, which then has resulted into more of a renter market um, and affordability issues, which then has also led to the potential for more downtown housing market um, as, a, as a result. Obviously, over the last really two to three decades, we've seen growth in double income households. That's resulted in not eating out, is, I mean, not eating in the house as much, and certainly more spending um, on restaurants. Many downtowns have benefited from that. We're seeing huge surpluses um, in downtown eating um, as a result. In fact, much of the growth in sort of retailing service in downtowns has been in food away from home. And then finally, just trends in sort of consumer pre preference um, that this growing interest in sort of local unique uniqueness and novel uh, novelty um, that says something about ourselves, um, sort of our self branding, has really led to a boom in craft breweries and artisans and other sort of craft related markets, uh, both like uh, foods and other um, area. Um, and then finally, um, and just in terms of where do ideas come from, we're seeing huge shifts in retailing um, overall and this advent of um, concepts around creative or experiential um, retailing. What we know from this, it can be, it can be many things. It's not really one, um, but it can be as simple as adding a service element to your existing retail or putting in a demonstration, a class, you know, providing education. Um, just being able to see someone make something, it would be another um, uh, sort of value add to this creative experiential uh, retail. There are many stores that are now adding um, other amenities um, to, their, um, to their offering. That I was in a store in um, Silvis, um, Illinois, and it was a gift store. And um, she offered me coffee while I was in there looking around. Um, and it was a simple setup. You know, it was just a Keurig and you make it and you shop. Um, I was in a jewelry store um, two weeks ago in Livermore, California, and they serve um, um, champagne and then a furniture store serving wine um, as you shop. Again, sort of these added amenities um, that are happening now within retailing. Um, you can add a complimentary product Second, uh, retail operation. Um, this is another big shift, I think, and you see an example here of Lucky Duck Bike Store, and I'll share some others, that is a repair shop and a cafe. Um, so it's not directly related to, to bikes, but many of the same people might enjoy those kinds of um, uh, um, retail um, activities. 
Um, we're seeing more offering local and unique product offerings, whether it's local foods um, or uh, locally uh, produced goods. And then finally, I think this is really critical, is the role of place in this creative experiential or innovation-based retail is really starting to uh, uh, to matter. That architecture and design, I mean, think about breweries. I mean, nine out of 10 are tending to, it seems, locate in a downtown old historic building rather than build something new or, you know, go into a suburban shopping center. You know, that alone is a statement about the importance of architecture and design as a branding element to traditional bricks and mortar retail. Um, and what the statistics are showing is this is really starting to pay off I and mean, then engage consumers that have these kinds of opportunities um, that I just mentioned are willing to spend more. That's the value added increment of being able to offer these kinds of innovative experiences within um, our, our downtown retail. Um, because, you know, I, there, I think one of the, the unique innovators of this was Starbucks originally. You know, most of the time it, it, it only costs you know, ourselves, if we were to make coffee in our, our house, probably 50 cents, 75 cents. But people are willing, both in Starbucks, but also now local coffee houses, to go out and spend 5 or $6 on a cup of coffee. And while the coffee might be a lot better, is it really $5 more better? And, and, and probably not. So there is an increment there that's really about the place itself, the experience that you're having in getting that cup of coffee that makes up that difference. And so you see that in some of the recent research that's showing that consumers will spend upwards of 60% more per transaction when there's an experience associated with it. They're much more loyal. Um, and um, many of them ex uh, say that they would pay a higher price for stores if they were to offer more experiences. They see that as tremendous value. These are just some examples of where we're seeing more sort of this creative retailing, just from coffee shops that are combined with florist, um, or this is really having trouble moving forward, or a motorcycle store that's carrying much more apparel. I, I live in Milwaukee, and there's a, a Royal Enfield, um, it, that's where their U.S. headquarters is, and they have a um, and, uh, a showroom store for their motorcycles here, and you walk into it, and it's only about uh, 2,000 square feet. It's not 20,000 square feet. And there's only about five motorcycles in the whole showroom. And the rest of it is apparel and nostalgia uh, kind of um, artwork and, you know, accessories, all to build around this experience that makes you maybe want to buy the motorcycle more than showing you, you know, 20 varieties of the same motorcycle. So it's a different way um, of bridging sort of this experience and selling uh, products. Hello Record Store and Coffee. A lot of times you're seeing this combination of, of um, you know, a, a standard sort of gift product, you know, whether it's apparel or whatever, with a food-based uh, product. This is Coffee and Books which is uh, a lot of our games, I should say. And then finally, um, Mojo Bikes and Brewery. Uh, this is down in North Carolina, uh, where you've got a combination of, you know, folks that want to buy bikes, want to go on group rides, and then afterwards enjoy beer. And so there's this complementary function for the same kind of user. So let's shift and let's talk um, in our the, the remaining time that we have um, now about just innovations in programming and how we can think through our traditional programming that we do in real estate and recruitment and add an innovation component uh, to it perhaps. So I think the first, and, and I, I think we're sort of on the cusp of this more and more, you know, lots of different industries um, have really migrated to um, trying out new concepts very quickly, seeing if they, they, they in, in essence, have some legs to it, if there's people that are interested in it, and then, if not, um, cutting it right away, okay? And then we call that fail fast, 
and sort of corporate research and development. And I think that concept is starting to reach um, how we look at retailing uh, in downtown from a research and development. You know, and, and, and pop-ups were really, uh, and, and in some cases mobile retailing, was really some of the first, you know, um, starts at that. So I think we're seeing now nuances in all forms of pop-up um, to, you know, expanding the pop-up model to be about um, even integrating it not in just a standalone store, but in existing stores. Um, I was in Bloomington, Illinois yesterday, and a new florist um, that had opened up four months ago, uh, Vera and Bucks, they now have a, uh, on occasion, uh, they bring in artists, and one most recently was someone that was doing watercolored postcards and selling them there, but also doing demonstrations. And then the florist, the new owner, was using them as gift items to send to folks that let her do their wedding or what have you, uh, that were hiring her to do an event. And she would use that as um, a way to thank them, as a, as a gift um, to them. And so um, she was getting something out of it. The, they were utilizing the store, which was bringing in additional customers that were then being exposed to both. Um, um, you know, entrepreneurs. And so I think, you know, this expansion of pop-up into existing businesses um, is something even on a temporary basis um, that uh, adds to the pipeline of new entrepreneurs in downtown. Um, we're also seeing, the again, this sort of sh uh, uh, nuance to the mobile um, or food truck kind of concept where um, even existing businesses are taking um, their products on the road in looking at expansion um, opportunities or just to um, accentuate existing um, sales outside um, of their um, existing books and mortar. So, um, you know, a brewery taking their uh, brewery to other towns that maybe are too small to make a full investment in and going to, um, you know, showing up in parks or, or what have you, or bike stores taking their, their store on the road to different races. Um, we're seeing online more, much more use of online tools like Etsy uh, to not only get started, but to accentuate sales. So Etsy, if you're not familiar with them, is, is really um, uh, an online platform for artisans, crafters, makers, and about 60% of their, um, their vendors on that site are existing traditional bricks and mortar uh, vendors. And so it is a way um, to sort of try out new concepts, um, but also expand sales. I'm going to share with you um, in just a little bit a, a concept around crowdsourcing in real estate, but we're also seeing crowdsourcing um, of ideas and using um, either just local platforms or national uh, platforms to think about buildings and what kinds of uses could go in there. And then finally, um, just being able to leverage entrepreneurship uh, programs uh, on a local level, like makerspaces, doing pitch it contests or Shark Tank events, having drop-in spaces. These are all sort of physical um, places where new entrepreneurs can try things out with minimal cost, test them, see if they have um, some legs to it, and then uh, perhaps get into a full-blown you know, store in the downtown. I think it's critical as we think um, about um, retailing, especially given the competitive nature of this market, that um, we continually look for ways to provide easy access um, without someone having to spend lots and lots of money uh, to test out an idea. So sort of proof of concept, uh, you might want to call it. Um, I think we're also seeing more innovation in the real estate uh, development space, and um, this is one group um, that's pretty interesting. Um, they're still uh, fairly small, but I, conceptually, um, I think um, there's some really interesting things here. There's a group called Hood Starter. They're based out of Minneapolis, and what they're doing is they're taking buildings, um, vacant buildings that uh, are underutilized buildings, and they're crowdsourcing what could go in there. And so it's a great way to involve the community from a community engagement perspective in what would you like to see um, in this building? And then being able to 
obviously relate that to the market of the downtown and see what has the most potential. And so this is one building. And then you can see here, people are voting on different concepts from coffee shop to a pizza place or existing businesses they'd like to see expand uh, from other neighborhoods um, into these places. And so it's just another sort of interesting way, um, much like we've always done where we might have put a sign in a vacant storefront window saying, hey, this building could be a X. Um, you know, this is just a, a way to take it to a social media uh, platform and have more community engagement in that process. Certainly, uh, and this is, an, this is an evolving um, field, that um, we continually see new ways of trying to finance real estate, um, which for many of us can be problematic um, if uh, we've either got a lot of vacancies or just not a lot of uh, local resources to do this kind of um, work um, that you might find in a big sort of urban area um, in terms of tools. But I think we're at some of the things that we're seeing change here are things like local foundations, whether it's a hospital foundation or a community foundation, is getting more involved in impact investing and, and frankly, economic development work. Um, and in some cases, looking for a return, so almost like a, an investor. And so there are local foundations that are interested in grouping with um, other maybe nonprofits or private individuals in funding uh, perhaps a real estate LLC investing group for the local community. So it's still mission driven. There's still a possible return, um, but it does relate uh, to the overall mission of local foundations. And so it's certainly an area to explore if you have some of those groups uh, locally. We're seeing uh, changes in sort of residential land trust as many areas are battling commercial gentrification, these hot market areas. They're seeing such quick transition and, and, and displacement of long time, you know, mom and pop retail or independent store owners um, where developers or private business uh, building owners are sort of holding out for larger chains, commercial, uh, and that's really changing the whole dynamic and feel of those particular areas. And so commercial land trusts may be another uh, sort of area to examine if you're being faced with those kinds of issues. And then finally, you know, with recent legislation around opportunity zones, um, this is still an area that is in its infancy um, in terms of, you know, knowledge and where deals are occurring. But we did some work just to examine um, the main streets. We have GIS maps for about 906 main street programs across the U.S. And we found that 46 of them have overlaps with opportunity zones. And so I would encourage you all to sort of look at where your opportunity zones are being uh, have been mapped and whether or not there's a portion of your downtown or all of your downtown um, or urban district that's part of this. Because um, right now, I mean, there's just, there, there's great opportunity, uh, as the name would imply, for outside investment uh, to occur um, in doing some of these things. Oh, just a quick question from the audience. Um, well, what was the online uh, platform for crowdsource? It's called Hood Starter. Yep, so you were correct. Hood Starter is the group. All right. The other thing I think we need to do uh, uh, for our economic vitality committees is I think we focus a lot on retail, and rightly so. It is an important and always has been historically an important component um, of our downtowns and, and districts. But I also think we have to remember at the same point, the downtowns were never exclusively retail. And, and so I think there are um, ways that we need to think beyond um, just retail and areas that we can explore that are highly innovative, um, but also add to the, the functionality of downtown. And one of them in particular um, that um, we've been seeing more of from a national perspective is in the area of manufacturing. And so, or small scale production. So we had uh, John Stover and Associates uh, who we've been working with. We used that same GIS uh, data that I was referring to earlier. And what we saw was that small scale producers or manufacturers were growing at a much faster clip, adding more jobs and experiencing higher sales growth when they were located in the downtown. So this isn't manufacturing like we traditionally thought um, of, like smokestacks and heavy equipment and 
dirty. This is going back to some of those original trends around logistics and how technology has downsized the scale of manufacturing equipment like you know sewing equipment, you know high speed sewing equipment, 3D printers, you know high speed uh, food processing equipment. And now you can, um, while it still can be uh, relatively expensive versus just starting an online, you can start a manufacturing company in the downtown where it has a retail component, but you're also shipping um, out the back door to wholesalers um, or as part of your online uh, business. This is a, a great opportunity, I think. Um, and this uh, particular group, Melizana in Leadville, Colorado, and it employs like 20 people in the downtown. Uh, so it's an employment opportunity. Um, so it just has a lot of, of great, um, um, you know, ramifications for, for downtown. And it's also part of that experiential uh, base because you can watch people making something. I think some other targets just in general to kind of expand our mindset as to retailing um, in, in, in quotes in downtown are things like academic facilities, um, senior housing, uh, where we're seeing some growth. Neutral location entrepreneurs, arts and cultural functions, you know, public activity spaces, even though not generating tax base, generate traffic. And as such, they act in some respects as retail anchors. You know, anything that's generating traffic um, in some respects you know, serves that, that, that need. And then certainly like temporary uses like farmers markets or pop-ups um, that can be retail, um, obviously. Uh, but on a temporary basis. In thinking about um, retention um, activities as part of our economic vitality, um, I do think that we need to um, uh, recognize that um, succession planning, uh, where which is an area that we really haven't been involved with, is going to be of ever importance um, as baby boomers begin to retire. And many of them make up the framework of our downtowns. So just in terms of the kinds of, you know, we, we've always done or hosted in some cases um, programming that would be helpful to our existing businesses. And so this is just an area to sort of think outside because it hasn't been a traditional area where we focused on. So whether you're just making connections or are using your small business development center, I think this is an area to, to work on. Helping your businesses move to um, more of a mobile and online platforms as additional um, revenue sources, but also just to expose those that are online to the businesses that you have in the downtown or, or the district. And then using mobile retailing as an expansion of a successful business. I, I use one here in Wooden Crate Popcorn. This is in Owasso, Michigan, in which a good percentage of their sales is now from internet-based sales. Um, and even in their marketing, you can see sort of the art of popcorn, we create delicious memories, um, is a way to bring that experience that you get in a traditional bricks and mortar to an online sales component. We're certainly seeing more innovations in housing as well, um, with probably uh, especially in urban areas, uh, this concept of co-living space, it's kind of like dorm living, where you have your own private bedroom, but you share a, a living room uh, and maybe even bathroom facilities and other amenities, fitness centers, that kind of thing. And many of them are also being combined with sort of the, the we work movement of, of um, you know, entrepreneurial drop-in spaces or work spaces for neutral location or nomads or, or gig economy workers, that kind of thing. And then finally, I put a chart here um, because again, it's not all just about single family housing. It's not all about just apartments or condos, but we're seeing great movements in senior housing and what's being labeled sort of moderate or workforce housing. That's where we have the greatest need for in many respects. Um, you, you might recognize moderate workforce is, is really um, a repositioning of affordable housing um, that in some ways has gotten stigma uh, in communities, but is, is really desperately needed. And so I think we'll see more sort of movement in that area. Um, and I'm just gonna conclude with a couple things on entrepreneurship in general. I think this is an area that um, for a long time, many Main Streets 
uh, again, may have not have been involved with, um, has been part and parcel of maybe a university or a small business development center. But I think as we look at rural environments, especially where in some cases our, the Main Street program is the only uh, sort of economic development-based program in that community, I think entrepreneurship um, needs to be another focal point for our economic vitality work. And you can see that a lot of this is due to that we're, we're having strong declines, unfortunately, in entrepreneurship, and most of that is occurring in rural areas. And then you factor in what I mentioned just earlier, um, a lot of baby boomers retiring. You can see that this is going to be a huge driver, I think, for economic vitality. How do we sort of replace um, both our existing your retiring folks, but then how do we create new pipelines of entrepreneurs um, to fill our other spaces or fill these new spaces uh, that are being vacated by our uh, retiring baby boomers? And so this is, a, I think, a huge point. Um, I would encourage you to, to check out some of the, the work that we've been doing on entrepreneurship ecosystems um, online, but uh, certainly begin those kinds of conversations about the role of place and the role of downtown and the Main Street organization within that ecosystem, um, because you certainly should have a seat at the table. And what we know is that in many respects, from a trend perspective, we're not seeing the kind of investment from outside like you may have seen historically, where a large manufacturer moves to another location um, and sets up and provides lots of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. What we know is that the biggest return on investments are when you invest from within and you look to cultivate new entrepreneurs. And so I would use that as a sort of a sounding tool for your economic vitality committee um, or task force or what have you to get them more involved um, in this work. So that, that concludes my remarks on um, sort of innovation-led um, economic vitality um, work. Um, but I'd certainly be interested if you have any questions and happy to try to tackle those or I've left my information up here if you'd like to reach out um, afterwards. I think this is sort of a new, unique, uh, unique <laughs> uh, thinking process that many of us are going through as we discover in a very competitive environment, um, retail environment especially, how we need to think differently on how we approach retailing and recruitment and retention kinds of activities in our downtowns. So any questions out there? Can you see the questions, Matt? Otherwise I can read them to you. Uh, I'm not seeing any right now, no. Thanks, Steve. Um, great presentation. Can we get copies of it? I'm, a, I'm assuming so, right, Steve? Like, or mm -hmm. I can make it available. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, we can send a um, kind of a PDF of it, Matt. Does that work? Yeah, that worked just fine. Okay, perfect. Um, what resources do you suggest for succession planning? Yeah, I know we did some early work, and I know that the um, the Michigan Main Street has been doing even more um, in this. But I think partnerships with your small business development centers. Um, they, many of them have um, either programs or the, by doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling that is geared towards um, succession planning. And so I would certainly encourage you as a first step to reach out and see what opportunities they have to provide those services uh, in your downtown. I don't see any other questions. We'll give folks one more minute if there's any last. Uh, what are the main differences when the main street is in a hot, urban high crime? What are the main differences when the main street is in an urban high crime, low income area? Well, I think this is really about process and scale and so these these tools i, I think are, are really just to um help explore and, and and frankly i think the whole concepts especially around like this retail research and development are ever more important in um places where we've had traditional disinvestment um occurring because there might not be the resources to start something that takes up a whole storefront we're doing things like 
pop-ups or if you have existing stores, allowing some space for complementary new businesses to kind of set up and, and, and leverage the traffic that's being created by that existing store. So I think a lot of these kinds of concepts um, and even on the real estate, things like opportunity zones um, or thinking about commercial land trusts would all be effective tools within areas that are experiencing um, disinvestment. Good. I don't see any more. I'll take a, take a minute to plug our next webinar, which is going to be on Wednesday, December 19th, um, which will be on making the case for your main street. Um, just talk about how to kind of promote yourselves and documenting, sharing community impact. And that will be led by um, Kathy LaPlante with the, with the National Main Street Center. So registration is open, so I'd encourage you to register if you're interested in that. And I don't see any other questions, Matt, so I think that concludes. Oh, one last one. Any suggestions for involving landowners who are content to receive monthly rentals from low-value retail outlets? Yeah, so um, a, a, a couple tools um, there, I guess. Um, you know, we, we have this thing called the 20-60-20 rule, and there's always like 20% that are great champions in your downtown willing to work with you, 60% sort of fence sitters, and then 20% that are your, I guess you could call them your, your pain in your backsides. Um, so I, I, I think you have to continually um, educate, work with them, and frankly, find opportunities um, if they're not willing to be aggressive or proactive on that front to demonstrate how they could increase revenues. I mean, I have to think that um, um, if it's an investment issue, that people still want to see greater returns for their, uh, their property. And so sometimes I think the onus is, is on us to um, to take that step if they're not willing to. Um, so that's education, that's proactive recruitment, that's um, by doing through other demonstration pro um, uh, you know, programs that they can then see um, how these changes um, are occurring and how it can be effective for them. And so sometimes it's just showing them how it can be done. And we have one other one um, regarding, I uh, just closed my question thing. Um, you mentioned opportunity zones. Will the National Main Street Center be developing any guidance on opportunity zones with a focus on Main Street? Yeah, um, I think um, I, I certainly see something coming down the lines um, on that. Not sure what form. Um, you know, we, like many other organizations uh, nationally and statewide and there's been a lot of interest from some of the state programs have been looking into this. You know, a lot of the, the framing around opportunity zones has been a little bit light in terms of the um, the, uh, uh, the federal guidelines um, around them. And so I, I, I think as we learn more um, and we feel comfortable in, in, in those, we'll certainly be sharing um, more of that with uh, the network. Perfect. That takes us just about the time as well, Matt. So thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Matt, thank you for this great presentation. Yep. Thanks, everyone.